eka mana, eka reo, eka moka whakahi, eka awawa, eka pātaka o ka o tāko tuku iho. Tēnā koutou. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name's David Murdoch. I'm the Vice-Chancellor of the University of Otago, and it's my great pleasure to uh, uh, welcome you here today to this uh, important event, the celebration of uh, Marilyn Hibmer's promotion to professor. And I must say that this is one of the, the great pleasures of my role, is to be part of these uh, wonderful events and get to see presentations from all over the university. And as many of you know, we've had a few delays recently with COVID, and we're back in the swing of things. And in fact, this week, we have four alone. So it's wonderful to be here and, and, uh, and to be back in the swing, as I say. My main role is to welcome you all and um, we welcome all those who are here uh, live, welcome those online. And uh, I know that many people are watching online from all around the world, uh, both live and delayed at some stage. So welcome everybody, welcome everyone from the uh, wider university community, uh, the wider Dunedin community and, and beyond. But I do want to especially welcome um, Marilyn's Fano and friends. And I have on good, count that there are quite a few, a few here, and I would particularly want to uh, mention uh, Marilyn's mother, Helen. Uh, welcome, nice to see you here. Um, brother, uh, Michael, uh, sister-in-law, Del, and also um, uh, Marilyn's partner, Lindsay. I've made a good guess in the front row here, so welcome <laughs> everybody. <laughs> I think I got it right. I also know there'll be other family members joining from uh, a lot of other places, including possibly from overseas, and also a lot of other people who have really been a support to Maryland over a long period of time, uh, former students, uh, former staff, uh, current and, and former staff and friends. And I gather from all around the world, Maryland was just uh, um, mentioning some of the country. So welcome to everybody. Um, before I hand over to Joe Baxter to give a bit more uh, of a detailed uh, introduction to Marilyn, I just want to mention that Marilyn and I have actually worked together for quite a number of years. And um, strangely, even though we both have research interests in microbes, it's actually, that's not the reason we've intersected mostly, it's about buildings. And for those who don't know, Marilyn's had a critical role in health sciences uh, managing a portfolio as Associate Dean of the Space uh, of our Space Issues in Health Sciences. And so I can attest that as a scientist, Marilyn has really developed quite an expertise in understanding construction and project management <laughs> and is now quite an expert in that area. But for me, this is a real, real treat to be able to um, listen to Marilyn today talk about her passion for viruses and viral immunology for a change as opposed to building. So um, big congratulations, Marilyn. Um, really well-deserved promotion. And I'll pass over to Joe Baxter. So norera, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. O kera tātou, e ngā mana, e ngā waka, e ngā reo, e ngā karangata, e ngā oti e motu, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, kia ora nō tātou katoa. Kei te tūau ki te mihi ki a koutou, ahakoa, uh, nō hia koe, nau mai, haru mai ki tēnei kōrero e te kaupapa o te haura. Me um, te he mihi nui ki te wahine toa, um, ko Marilyn. Um, well, kia ora everyone, and it is a huge honour and privilege for me to be able to stand up here and to introduce Marilyn. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm Jo Baxter, I am the uh, very new Dean of the Dunedin School of Medicine, and I was absolutely delighted to be offered the opportunity to introduce Marilyn today. I have known Marilyn for a number of years, and um, I think um, there are a few people that have really inspired me as a woman who's taking on leadership roles within the university, and Marilyn is one of those, and so I want to acknowledge you, Marilyn, personally for that. Um, so I also want to acknowledge Marilyn's whānau and friends who are here in person and on Zoom, and also uh, to colleagues, students, and many others who are here today. So Marilyn is, has many strings to her bow, 
And I want to start with her as a, um, as a staff member who is the Deputy HOD in the Department of Pathology. She's a viral immunologist whose research interest is human papillomavirus and cancer. She completed her PhD studies in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology at Otago, and her postdoctoral work was carried out at the Imperial Cancer Research Fund Laboratories at the University of Cambridge in the UK. Much of Marilyn's research has explored immune regulation by human papillomavirus, with a particular focus on viral regulation of antigen-presenting cells in the skin. She has led the development of a collaboration to support implementation research for HPV screening in the Pacific and, in, and is part of a team that applies Kaupapa Māori methodology to explore the use of HPV DNA testing to maximise uptake in underscreened Māori. Her research continues to contribute to advances in basic biology of HPV and its clinical application to reduce the incidence of cervical cancer. Um, alongside David, I would also like to acknowledge Marilyn's other significant contribution that I have um, been involved with, and that is as the Associate Dean of the Space Portfolio in the Division of Health Sciences. And in that role, I have been, I suppose, really impressed with Marilyn's capacity to... Um, is anyone here? I'll just check who's in the orders. To herd cats, <laughs> to be able to deal with something that is incredibly complex, both at a big systems issue, but also right down to detail. And as I was thinking about uh, how we have someone who's got such an amazing research background and who has taken her research from the um, bench through past the bedside and into um, big picture capacity to make a difference at a public health issue, I see that she has that, I think, rare capacity to be able to work at the level of extreme detail, but at the same time hold the wider context. And I think that's a really unusual and rare, rare capacity. So I want to acknowledge you. So um, without further ado, uh, Marilyn's presentation this evening spans the translational research continuum from that basic biomedical research exploring the interface between HPV and the immune system and immune microenvironment and HPV precancer through to the implementation of a point of care HPV testing. So I wish to invite Professor Marilyn Hibmer to present her lecture. Kia ora. Tēnā koutou katoa, ko te whanganui tāra te whenua e hono neki tāko whānau, ko Sabayak te waka, ko Tatimana tōko iwi, nō no Otapoti aho ko Marilyn Hibma tōko ingoa. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Vice-Chancellor and esteemed colleagues, uh, welcome guests and friends and family, it's so lovely to see you all here. Today it is my opportunity to promote to you my research and tell you about what I've been doing for the last however many years, in fact, since probably the 1990s. I want to put my research in the context of a translational research success story, and that is the success story for human papillomavirus and cervical cancer. We have gone from the stage of not actually understanding what the causality of this virus, uh, of this cancer is, right through to now being able to vaccinate and to protect people against a particular cancer. That is underpinned by basic biomedical research. So I'll introduce to you this concept of translational research. Translational research is the idea that we, do, we carry out basic research and clinical research in a continuum that leads to health, improved health outcomes. So we have translation from basic science to human studies and translation of clinical knowledge 
into improved health outcomes. This is the general concept of bench to bedside. This is really critical and has been illustrated very well in the context of human papillomavirus and the role in cervical cancer. I had to reflect on my research career and wonder about how I could possibly uh, put this in a context and prioritise what I should talk about and what I should perhaps edit out. So what I did was made a word cloud of all the people that I have uh, co-authored publications with, and that's what you can see here, this wonderful range of people. And these people have been important collaborators or students or staff uh, throughout my research career. And I'll start by picking out just a few names as I go through this talk. So we have this broader concept of this translational research, and we have some specific people along the way that are also part of the context of my research. And the first of those people is Emeritus Professor Frank Griffin. And he is named because he was my PhD supervisor. So I first came over here into Dunedin in 1980 uh, to do medical intermediate. I, not long after I arrived, got glandular fever, which is of course a disease caused by the Epstein-Barr virus. And that really knocked me around and it gave, did a few things. It gave me an interest in viruses and the immune system and it also De redirected my career from the idea of doing medicine to the idea of perhaps doing science. I got involved in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology and uh, with Frank Griffin. Frank Griffin is shown here uh, and this animal here was a big part of what Frank Griffin did. When I went into the lab, Frank spent a lot of time talking to farmers. And I thought, why is he talking to farmers and not paying attention to me? Because I'm one of his students, come on. But actually what he was doing is what I now understand as stakeholder engagement. He was really working on what is important to the farmers and what can make a difference. The other person on this slide is James Innes, and I would also like to acknowledge Mingo Innes, who is streaming in today, who is James's son. James was pivotal because he was uh, part of Holden Station, and Holden Station was a big deer farm near Fairley. James and Holden Station funded my PhD research and also some of the experimentation that was carried out was actually done with deer on that farm. We were privileged to be able to fly out there one day and see what an amazing operation this farm was. So full credit to the Innes family. James is no longer with us sadly, but he was truly inspiring and committed to bridging this gap into uh, research. So during this time we did a few things. We characterised deer immunoglobulin. This was actually the first characterisation of deer immunoglobulin. And it was the mid to late 80s. Monoclonal antibody technology was relatively recently discovered and we made the first monoclonal antibodies to deer immunoglobulin. We established adjuvants. So adjuvants are things that we add to protein when we make a vaccine we established adjuvants that worked really well in deer. This was important if we were to vaccinate deer. And we determined that antibody responses actually were enhanced after deer were separated. So this was a bit of a surprise. We expected the immune system to be suppressed. What we saw was actually enhancement of the immune response following a, a separation stress where we took the uh, the, we weaned the animals and we looked at the, um, the antibodies of the mother. So a few surprises and a few discoveries and a few tools that were made. At the end of that PhD, the, the next thing that people tend to do is look at where they might do a postdoc and what might interest them. 
I was particularly interested in going to Britain. I didn't really want to go to the US, uh, but I really liked the idea of going to Britain. I'd never been to Cambridge, but of course it's steeped in history and it is an amazing place with regard to science. We were actually, I got a postdoc in the Imperial Cancer Research Fund, which was in a prefab on the top of this building, and this is the Department of Pathology. There, I worked in a lab with some amazing people. Here we see Toshiyuki, Toshiyuki Sasagawa, who I'm still uh, in contact with, Mas Massimo Tomasino. Ken Raj was someone I had amazing conversations with during lunch times every day while I was there. And John Dorbar was one of those names you will have seen in that word cloud. Jian Zhu uh, was pivotal in uh, the virus-like particle that was used as the vaccine, and I'll come back to him later. But the key person during my time there was this person named Lionel Crawford. And Lionel Crawford had spent a lot of time at Cold Spring Harbour. He was right in the thick of this area of DNA tumour viruses. He was particularly interested in human papillomavirus, but his background was in fact outstanding because he was one of the co-authors on the paper where they published about the molecule P53. And P53 is one of the most important cancer proteins that we know about. He was an inspiration and when I first arrived there, I was fairly impoverished, as students are after they've finished their PhDs. He and Elizabeth, his wife, very kindly took me in and I stayed with them for probably about four weeks while I got established and found a flat. Uh, so they were really, really supportive and I have fond memories of Lionel basically downloading all of his information that he knew about human papillomavirus, this curious DNA tumour virus, in the backyard during lunch times uh, while we would eat our lunch and cycling into work after Lionel um, on the way to the pathology department. So really uh, quite exciting times. But what about the research? In the context of what we were doing, if you look at that time frame, it was 1990 I went from uh, Otago across to Cambridge. Now, when we think of the cervical cancer and the timeline, often we start with the 1800s where there was a paper published that made the observation that nuns and unmarried women didn't get cervical cancer. That was curious. So that was a suggestion that there might have been an infectious etiology relating to a sexually transmitted infection in relation to the causality of cervical cancer. And then if we fast forward to 1933, the next pivotal moment was George Papanicolaou. And he developed the pap smear, which is basically a smear of cells taken from the cervix where you can identify changes in those cells and use that diagnostically to establish pre-cancer. Uh, that way you can treat women by ablative therapy and prevent the cervical cancer. And that is still the basis of our screening program today. Harold Surhausen in 1983 was really big on the idea that there was a viral etiology to this cancer. And what he did was able to, was able to find HPV DNA in cervical biopsies. So this established the link between the virus and the cancer. He was also able to clone specific genes, so take bits of those virus and put them into bacteria and make more of them, make the proteins. And that was also important because that enabled people to study this virus and actually work on it. It's not a virus that you can easily culture. You can't just take this virus and put it with some cells and grow it. So this cloning of DNA was really significant. 
And in 1990, uh, we started our National Cervical Screening Program in New Zealand. Of course, this was after much controversy with the Cartwright Inquiry and, uh, indeed. So what was this all about? This was about this virus that you can see here. This is a cryo-electron microscopy image of the virus, and what you're seeing is the proteins on the outside of the virus. So this is the L1 and L2 proteins that make up the coat of the virus. So we've got a couple of proteins, and inside that is some DNA. And that DNA encodes eight different genes, and those genes are really quite interesting in themselves. You'll all be familiar with this virus. Who here hasn't had a wart on their feet or a, a, a wart such as this that proliferates out, perhaps on their hands? Warts are very common. There are over 200 types of human papillomavirus, and fortunately only 12 of them cause cancer. So uh, there are many other types that don't cause cancer, and you can see some of those types, disease caused by some of those types demonstrated here. But this is what we were particularly interested in because of the global burden of cancer, of cervical cancer. Here you can see the Papa Nicolau smear that shows normal cells, but also shows cells with changes that indicate that there is a virus infection there. So that can be used diagnostically. And here we see a cervix, and we see the region that is affected with effectively what's a viral infection in the cervix. If this infection persists, this can become cancer over time. And how does that happen? Well, you're looking at a virus that infects our cutaneous surfaces and our mucosal surfaces. It infects the epithelium, so this is the outside of our skin, and these are the dividing cells in the bottom of our skin, the basal layer. Here's the normal epidermis. Here's the virus particles getting in. They're getting in through a microabrasion or tissue damage. They get into these bottom cells and start uh, that are dividing, and they start to replicate. Then in a, in a uh, life cycle that's associated with the differentiation of the skin cells, we start to get virus particles produced. If that infection is persistent, we can get changes. The virus can incorporate its genome into our cells and we can start to get pre-malignant lesions that may progress to invasive cancer. Here we were at a situation where we knew that there we, could, we had cloned viral genes, we knew HPV caused cancer. Here was an opportunity to develop a prophylactic vaccine. And that was really what Lionel got me in to do. So there's a whole variety of proteins that we can actually look at if we want to make a vaccine. Any of the viral proteins could potentially be targets. I spent a bit of time thinking about this and thought, what about one of these early proteins? Because they're really important in keeping the virus infection going. Others pursued the late proteins, and we know the end of the story because, in fact, it was the late proteins that became part of the vaccine that's used today. So, with a focus on this E2 protein, we had to do some particular things along the path to make a vaccine, and one of those was to purify the protein. One of them was to make these monoclonal antibodies against the E2 protein, and those antibodies that we made are still being marketed and sold today globally. We also looked at this E2 protein and what it did, how it interacted with one of the other HPV proteins called E1. At the end of that postdoc, it was time to return to New Zealand. Uh, we'd made that decision, and so I contacted Frank Griffin and thought, well, perhaps there's an opportunity here to come back to Univers University of Otago. Frank spoke to this person here, Andrew Mercer. Andrew Mercer uh, was the head, the director of the virus research unit 
in the microbiology and immunology department. And as you can see by the size of his name, we published many papers together. And Andrew is actually travelling in the North Island today, so it's not able to be here. But what we had was a wonderful team of people who were working on all virus and we also worked on human papillomavirus. And you can see that team of people here, and I particularly want to acknowledge Kathy McCorn and Eleanor Whelan, who are sitting in the audience with us today. So, what about the immune system? I'm afraid it's time to educate you a little bit about it. The immune system is made up of the white cells in our body a whole range of different cells that are, they differentiate into different cell types that do different things. People sometimes think of these as a sol soldiers in an army, as specialists in some way, and they absolutely are. I'm going to introduce you to just a few different cell types. Of particular interest are the antigen presenting cells. There are two different flavors of these cells the dendritic cells and the Langerhans cells. The Langerhans cells are the ones that are in the skin. That's why I have an interest in those. These dendritic cells and Langerhans cells, the antigen-presenting cells, take up the little bits of virus and they present it. But they have to present it nicely. It's got to be packaged well in the right way. If it's not, the lymphocytes don't always respond in the right way. And the lymphocytes are our defending army. They're the ones that can do things like kill virus-infected cells. They can also kill cancer cells. They can kill, uh, we have helper T cells that produce chemicals that can have antiviral effects. And we have B cells, and these B cells produce antibodies, if you think of our recent COVID situation, those B cells were really critical in neutralizing virus particles to uh, inactivate them and stop infection. So, if we were interested in developing a vaccine, first we want to know, is there actually any natural immunity to this virus? Because wouldn't we think that we would want to look for the natural immunity and try and enhance it or mimic it? We looked at immunity to HPV infection in humans, and what we saw was that the E2 protein that we'd selected as our favorite protein, as our uh, immunogen for this vaccine, contained the right bits. It contained bits that were really attractive for the helper cells and for the cytotoxic T cells. So tick, that sounded great. The helper T cell responses could be detected in women who had cervical dysplasia. So this is the early stage HPV infection. Great, tick. Not only that, but it was associated with resolution of that cervical dysplasia. That's even better. And you look at antibodies to L1, and what did we see? Actually, they were not associated with resolution. What a surprise. Really surprising, considering that this is the basis of our vaccine. And it goes to show that nature doesn't always tell us the best way to make a vaccine. Sometimes we can introduce a, uh, take a strategy that actually works better than what works in response to a virus in nature. So in terms of E2, it all looked rosy. We did some things in terms of developing a vaccine. We were able to show that if we took the E2 protein and transduced it into these antigen-presenting cells, mm. we could make a really nice package that was attractive for the, uh, to, to control the E2 response in vaccinia virus. So basically that meant that these killer cells were there, and that these helper cells were being activated. So it was all rosy. We could immunize mice with the E2 protein and this adjuvant called MF59. 
MF59 is an adjuvant that's already used in humans, so we thought, oh, this is great. Something's already been tested, it's been FDA approved. We're on good track here. Not only that, but we can make our helper T cell responses and we can make our cytotoxic T cell responses. So we've got the killer, we've got the killers, and we've got the help. It's all going swimmingly. In the meantime, while we were doing all this, Jan Zhu, who I showed you that photo of, who was in the lab in Cambridge, assembled a virus-like particle made up of the L1 protein, the Coke protein. By 2001, 10 years later, there was an FDA approval granted for HPV testing. But more importantly, 2006, uh, 2006 there was FDA approval granted for an HPV vaccine. And only two years later, we were vaccinating our children, our young girls, in New Zealand. We now vaccinate our boys as well, and that's because HPV is also important in the causality of head and neck cancer. So it's really important that we also vaccinate boys. Well, time to stop thinking about that prophylactic vaccine and move on to something therapeutic. Because what about all those people who couldn't get the prophylactic vaccine, couldn't be protected against this virus, already had been exposed, and were getting disease? At the moment, the disease is ablative. You're basically cutting it, something out or you're burning something off, and that's quite destructive. So what about if you could just vaccinate and the condition would disappear. The cells would just go because those killer cells would come in, the helper cells would come in, and the cells would go. Cured. Sounds great. Well, in context, the Herald on uh, 16th of October 2005, we had Hazel Lewis, who was the head of the National Screening Program in New Zealand, saying, what's now needed is a treatment for women already infected with HPV. So she agreed this was a great idea. But what Hibma said was actually the virus is very good at hiding itself in the body, says Hibma. So the immune system doesn't realise it should be mounting an attack until it's too late. Hibma is currently looking at ways to expose the sinister cloaking mechanism. Success is a way off, says Hibma, but Fraser's success, that's Ian Fraser, who with Jan Zhu developed the L1 vaccine, the prophylactic vaccine, has given all researchers a boost and served as a reminder that funding for health and science research does pay off. It certainly paid off with the prophylactic vaccine. That all sounds great, but in fact, therapeutic vaccine is, vaccination is way, way harder than prophylactic vaccines. And there's a whole lot of reasons for that, and they're mostly surrounding the fact that pathogens can avoid the immune system, as can cancer cells. So if we think of an HPV infection, we have two scenarios here. On the one side, for a lot of women, they actually do develop an immune response. They do clear the viral infection they resolve it and they don't need follow-up treatment, they don't progress and get cancer. It's only about 1% who progress and part of that is contributed to by immune evasion. We have this immune system, these T cells and these B cells and these antigen presenting cells. They're there to help us, but what about the virus? They're trying, if the virus is trying to avoid being detected because it just wants to keep repl replicating and making more of itself. It wants to spread, it wants to infect other people. So we knew therapeutic vaccination was going to be harder, but the one benefit was that the proteins that we were going to target became way easier. This is because when HPV progresses towards causing its cancer causality, it is a consequence of the viral DNA getting incorporated into the chromosomes. So the virus normally exists as an episome, this viral episome, 
what it does, it gets linearized and incorporated and integrated into our DNA. When this happens, invariably there are two proteins that are retained, the E6 and the E7 protein. Those two proteins are cancer-causing proteins. E6 binds to that protein that Lionel discovered, co-discovered, the protein called P53. That guardian of the genome protects our DNA from other changes in, it, in, uh, in the sequences and keeps, keeps everything ticking along. When it's lost, there's the potential for mutations. And the other protein, E7, binds and degrades this other protein in our cells called retinoblastoma, RB. And RB is important in this controlling the cell cycle. When it's lost, we get uh, dysregulation of the cell cycle. So after those two events occur, we get upregulation of these, and we get integration, we get increased expression of these proteins. We subsequently get additional mutations, and those are the events that eventually result in the cancer. So E6 and E7, obvious targets, because they're always retained in the cancer cells. So great proteins to use for a therapeutic vaccine. That's exactly what we did. We knew by then that virus-like particles were great as immunogens. They generated a really good response. Here you can see a virus-like particle made out of rabbit hemorrhagic disease. It, it contains bits of protein that are particularly attractive for helper T cells. That's these little padre sequences. And coupled to that, we put an E6 epitope, so a little piece of this E2 protein, uh, E6 protein that is uh, basically attractive for the killer cells. So we have the helper component, we have the cytotoxic component. We can immunize mice with these components and then look at the survival following uh, uh, a cancer, in a cancer model. So basically first we take some cancer cells, we inject them subcutaneously in the mouse. We then look at uh, the immunizations, the therapeutic vaccines, and we look at how long the mouse is able to survive. But this is to a humane endpoint. So we euthanize the mice uh, way before they actually get sick, but once the tumors reach a certain size. So here you can see without the vaccination, it's about 40 days that we have to do that. And with vaccination, we can extend that to about 60 days. So we can extend the life of a mouse that has cancer. But if we add uh, this CTLA-4 antibody, this is known as a checkpoint inhibitor. These checkpoint inhibitors are now being used in the clinic for the control of cancer. If we add that checkpoint inhibitor, you can see we can further extend the survival in these mice. What that tells us is that what we were presenting was something that kind of looked like this, and if we add a checkpoint inhibitor, it can look more like this, more attractive. That suggests that there were immune evasion mechanisms or regulation of these antigen-presenting cells that was inhibiting their ability to present effectively to the immune system. We then launched into quite a lot of study of immune suppression mechanisms mediated by these E6 and E7 proteins. We found a whole lot of different things. Large extracellular vesicles are little bits of cell that are shed from all of our cells. We found that if we put this E6 and E7 protein into cells, those little bits that are shed off are actually really quite suppressive for the immune system. So these things can signal in our body. They can inhibit the antigen-presenting cells and subsequently inhibit the cytotoxic T cell response. This is a piece of skin, human skin cut in a section, cut downwards if you were to cut down into your skin this way. 
This is the top of the skin and this is the bottom of what we know as the epidermis. Here we can see these green stained cells. These are bound by an antibody that fluoresces green that helps identify them. You can see these beautiful cells here are the Langerhans cells. Those antigen presenting cells in our skin that help defend us and present antigen to the T cells. We found that the viral protein E7, if you express that in the skin, it actually suppresses the cytotoxic T cell response. So that provides direct evidence that the T cell, the E7 protein is inhibiting the immune response and the ability of cells to come in and kill those cells expressing the E7 protein. We also uh, showed that this protein called ecoterin, this adhesion molecule, is suppressed by the HPV virus. And that's important because that, that molecule helps the Langerhan cells stick and stay in the site. By losing that E6 protein, these Langerhan cells are, by losing that ecoterin protein, these Langerhan cells are able to migrate and um, are unimpeded. We also curiously showed that these Langerhan cells, which are antigen presenting cells and you'd think would be really important, actually, if you got rid of them altogether, it didn't make any difference to the T cell response. So again, sometimes what you think is going to be the right thing actually turns out to be quite different. So that was it. We learnt a whole lot of things about how HPV is avoiding de de detection and why it is so hard to make this therapeutic vaccine. My next move was after being in microbiology initially, then to pathology and then in microbiology, was back to pathology to the Herkes building. You can see that lovely building here. In 2014, I took up a position in the pathology department. By then, you can see there's still not been any significant advances in terms of therapeutic vaccination. We still don't really have an effective therapeutic vaccine in the clinic. But what we do have, following on from this HPV testing, is some advances in testing for the virus that helps us diagnostically uh, for detecting pre-cancer stages. There are two things here that I want to highlight, and one is the Feed Gene Expert, which is a point of care test which lets you test people in the clinic and give, give them results within an hour, making that very accessible for women. And in 2023, uh, we have a big advance in New Zealand in that HPV testing will become the primary screen. So no longer will we be looking for those changes in the cells, we will now be looking for the presence of the virus. This is the current screening with the cyto brush and for the women in the audience who have experienced this, this involves the speculum, the dreaded speculum, it's not particularly comfortable or pleasant. And the clinician takes a brush of the cervix take to get the cells and those are looked at after they've been stained. This uh, has a degree of sensitivity and specificity. On the right hand side here, we have the DNA test, which is much more sensitive and similarly specific. So we get increased sensitivity. But a major advance with this is that it's very enabling. You don't need that speculum anymore. A woman can do this herself with a swab. It can just be a vaginal swab, and it's good enough. So wow, what an advance. Not only that, a result that's negative is good for five years. So you don't need to come back so often. Great, happy days. We were very interested in this concept of point of care for HPV and the combination with the DNA test, the swab, in terms of accessibility and uh, particularly in countries that maybe don't have screening programs currently. 
So I then want to acknowledge uh, Beverly Lawton, who was at University of Otago Wellington and is now at Victoria University. And I've worked with her for a number of years, looking at a whole range of uh, aspects of HPV vaccination and particularly inequity in Māori. I'd also like to specifically acknowledge at this point Komatoa Matthew Bennett, who's been involved in this research and has really helped to steer a very, very steady walker. Just highlight a few papers in relation to this work. And the first is around acceptability of a self-taken swab. There were a lot of questions about this idea of a swab uh, and whether it would be acceptable, whether it would be trusted. Uh, can, can we do this ourselves when a clinician probably does it better was a question. I think our attitudes have changed quite a lot with COVID now that we're all busy testing ourselves for the virus uh, without hesitation. We've demystified a lot of that, but this article was published in 2019 and the question really was, if you have women who are underscreened, who have real issues with getting access to healthcare provision, will a self-collected swab help with that? Because we know some of the barriers are actually around the physical process of getting the swab. Some of the barriers are actually around getting to where you need to get the swab taken. And this study, uh, this qualitative research, indicated that this was really going to help in uh, Maori women. We also did research looking at uh, really the introduction of HPV uh, testing in women and the impact in, at the community level. And that was the, uh, this was the outcome of that research. There's another study underway currently that is looking at point of care and using that particular device that I showed before, that gene expert, and whether having that in the clinic is going to shorten the pathway to colposcopy, to treatment for women, in, uh, uh, particularly in Maori women. Samoa was a point of focus. We carried out stakeholder engagement in Samoa, particularly because Samoa doesn't currently have a screening program. There's no organised HPV screening. We developed the Cervical Cancer Prevention in the Pacific collaboration, and you can see there were a number of meetings held in Samoa. And the outcomes of that included Ale uh, Professor Alaki Karoma, who's now the uh, Vice-Chancellor of the National University of Samoa, setting up a private clinic with this point-of-care device in Apia. So women can now access that. The other outputs, or still to, some still to be realised, are building uh, capability amongst uh, Samoan clinicians particularly. So on the left-hand side, we have Dr. Malama Tufanai, who did a study in Samoa looking at the acceptability of HPV self-testing. And that study, again, qualitative study, supported the introduction of this as an accessible test. And at the back of the room, we're very honoured to have Dr. Filipina Amosa Lisam, who's looking at changes in the tumour microenvironment or in the tissue microenvironment in cervical precancer. She's a pathology-based, uh, tr pathology-trained clinician who is here in New Zealand and plans to go back to Samoa in the future. We look forward to her PhD journey. The last piece of research I want to talk about is involving uh, Associate Professor Peter Sykes, who's at Otago, University of Otago Christchurch. He's an ONG surgeon and he's been a wonderful collaborator over the years. Of particular significance was his study known as the Princess Study. And this was to look at women under the age of 25. He was aware, along with a number of other people, that there may have been some overtreatment of women 
being carried out, particularly in younger women, because a lot of younger women have disease that will regress naturally. So he set up a study known as the Princess Study where he looked at women who had this pre-cancer stage called cervical intraepithelial neoplasia grade two, SIN2, and monitored them observationally. So instead of treating them, just monitored their progress and treated them if they needed to be treated. For us, this was a wonderful opportunity because it allowed us to look at women who had disease that progressed and women who had disease that persisted or regressed. Any progressed disease was of course treated as soon as it was identified. We were interested in this particularly and we continue to be interested in this because with HPV testing, we have a much more specific test, but a lot of those women will still have disease that regresses naturally. So don't, doesn't, they don't need to be treated. If all those women go to colposcopy to be <coughs> looked at, that's a lot of resource at specialist services. And so that may provide issues with access. And they've shown in other countries where they've introduced HPV screening that there's about a threefold increase in colposcopy referrals. So what we want is another test that can be done at the same time as the HPV test, or it can at least be sampled at the, H at the same time. We can then take that sample and test it later if the woman is HPV positive. And we want to look for markers that relate more to disease. And here we've looked at the tissue microenvironment. So here these are HPV SIN2 lesions and we've looked to see what is related to progression in these women and what's related to regression. So from this we can profile the good things, uh, particularly as we'd expect, the helper T cells, the antigen presenting cells, the CD4 and the CD8 T cells, and uh, we can look at the bad things, the things that are associated with progression, such as molecules such as BLIMP1, HMGB1, FOXP3. So what we want to identify is, identify, is determine a biomarker that identifies disease that's likely to progress, so we can make sure those women go to colposcopy and the women who don't need to treat, be treated can be observationally managed while their disease regresses. So I hope today I've been able to convince you that there is significant benefit to translational research and that basic biomedical research and clinical research leads to improved health outcomes. I've illustrated this through this journey with the HPV vaccine and HPV DNA testing, which was all basic biomedical research that is now part of clinical management and treatment and prevention for this cancer. It's those discoveries that have led to the point where now the WHO, WHO is declaring that by 2030 they want to eliminate cervical cancer as a public health issue, and that's a global call. I feel like there's a lot of work to do to achieve that, but we certainly have some tools in the toolbox. Several people mentioned my interest in space, so I couldn't really, with a senior leadership team here, how could I avoid reminding them of the importance of this image here? This is Dunedin. This is our new Dunedin Hospital. Here we have a $1.4 billion investment in healthcare. What an opportunity, because sitting over here, we have a bunch of basic biomedical researchers, and here we have a lot of clinicians. Here you'll notice that we've removed the existing hospital because that's just in the way and no one will want to be in there once we've got a new one, we've created this wonderful corridor to ensure that we have a pathway for our basic biomedical researchers and our clinical researchers to get together to make the types of discoveries that will translate into new, into improved health outcomes. And not only that, here is proposed a clinical and translational research building, which is going to form the hub of this activity 
It's going to involve external engagement with these innovation partners. This is something that is really going to enhance this investment opportunity that we see in Dunedin. So as a city, we have an opportunity here as well. I would like to conclude by acknowledging the extensive number of staff and students I've had in the lab over the years, and they are listed here. And I really do acknowledge all of their wonderful uh, contributions over the years and contributions to this research and continuing contributions, and it's wonderful to see some of those key people in the audience here today. I'd like to acknowledge the funding bodies that have supported this research over the years. And I thank you for your attention. Marilyn, thank you so much. For those of you who don't know, I'm Alison Rich. I've been head of the Department of Pathology at the Dunedin campus for two and a half years now, and I want to acknowledge, first of all, your support as Deputy Head of, of Department, Marilyn. I also wanted to acknowledge all of the work that you've done for the division uh, at, with the space thing. I think you've just shown us um, how you can put your case across to, to an audience uh, very well, but also for many years you've been chair of the space committee for the Department of Pathology, and that's a, a smaller job, but it's also one that has been time consuming and, and tricky from time to time, so thank you for that. But my main job today is to thank you very much for this um, presentation. It was lovely to see your journey across this very interesting topic. I think it was great the way that you weaved your mentors in, into that talk. And the short time I've been in the department, I've seen how you are bringing on your students. And so in times to come, they will say those same supportive things about you. Just every time I have an opportunity as an oral pathologist, I just have to strike that, um, that, that drum a little bit. And that's why I enjoyed that talk so much as well, because the vaccine uh, against um, the uh, oncogenic types of HPV is obviously very important for cervical cancer, but some types, not all, but some types of oral and oral and maxillofacial and oropharyngeal cancers are associated with HPV virus infection as well. So we just can't wait to see what the vaccine is going to do in the longer terms to tonsillar and um, oropharyngeal cancer. So it's another little thing. So in all, Marilyn, just thank you so much. Wonderful talk, so nice and clear to keep your audience involved. Um, so that is, it's just great. And it's my pleasure on behalf of the university to present you with this gift. Now I'm going to... <laughs> I'm going to hand over now to Patricia, uh, Trish Priest, our acting PVC Health Sciences to conclude. Thank you, Alison. Um, kia ora koutou. So I'm Trish Priest. I'm the acting Pro Vice Chancellor of Health Sciences which means that I also have to say how much I value Marilyn's support on space and building matters because <laughs> I understand nothing. And she's a steady support and um, very knowledgeable person to have on committees. Um, so I have the very uh, easy and pleasant task of um, inviting you for a cup of tea and um, some refreshments in the staff club after this and to ask you to, one more time, um, thank Marilyn for her really excellent talk. Thank you.